Hello, and welcome back to the Battle Wagon for another Legions Imperialis video. I've seen YouTube videos stating that the Legions of Startes always win games, Reddit posts contradicting this with the claim that Solar Auxilia units are too powerful, and Discord complaints that Marines, especially Terminators, aren't true strength to their lore. One thing for sure though, close combat in Legions Imperialis is extremely deadly. What I haven't seen anyone do is talk about the tactics and intricacies involved in close combat engagements. There are quite a few factors that go into what makes or breaks a unit in close combat, and in this video I'll discuss unit stats, engagement, pinning, timing, terrain, and then I'll finally explore some advanced tactics that I've seen used effectively. Obviously, close assault factor is a big part of what people refer to in games as the calculus, but what is not the end-all be-all? Just as important is the ability to successfully move into engagements on your own terms. Remember that charging occurs at twice the movement value, so each inch is doubly important. There are no saves in engagements, but being able to survive long enough to get into melee is important. Traits like Rend, Furious Charge, Jump Packs, and even Implacable can greatly affect engagements as well, and certain Legions of Starty's army rules have traits that benefit engagements as well. Without going into details, notable legions include uh, Dark Angels, Blood Angels, World Leaders, Raven Guard, and even Alpha Legion. Check out my video on Allied Contingents for some of these legion builds. Certain formations also grant close combat benefits for detachments. Uh, notably, the Solar Auxilia Pioneer Company grants infiltrate to their infantry and forward deployment to everything else. Finally, scale can help determine who can fire and when and whether or not you are pinned. Here's a list of some of my favorite loadouts for notable legions of Starty's detachments from the first book. Typically useful close assault factors range from 2 to 5. Rend on models like the Leviathan average an additional 3.5. It should be also noted that their vehicles aren't completely helpless and have either a 2 or 3 close assault factor, so with a lucky roll you might be able to survive against some things. On average, there are fewer solar auxiliary units that can stand up to engagements, however, auxiliary units tend to be more specialized. Of the first book, only the Bane Blades have a close assault factor of 4, while the Ogren and Velatari have Rend for an additional average of 3.5 above what they're listed here. There are five notable detachments that I wanted to highlight in detail. First off are the Assault Marines. The difference between the other highlighted units and this one having a 7 inch threat range rather than the 5 inch threat range on the other units is an increase of 40% especially when considered that's 4 inches when you are charging. They have a save of 5 plus, close assault factor of plus 3, morale of 3 plus, they can be taken as a tactical upgrade or as a straight support unit. My preference would be support unit in this case, and they have jump packs, independent if they're a tactical upgrade, and they can benefit from Legion Special Rules. Their jump packs provide a safety when riding in air support transport, such as the Thunderhawk, and an additional plus one close assault factor when charging garrison models. Assault Marines are the least expensive unit on my list and can very easily wreak havoc on backline units in great numbers. I'm not a fan of Storm Eagles by default, because if you choose one, you can only put four Assault Marines in it. But if you choose two, you can only put eight Assault Marines because they can only be taken as a maximum of eight as a support slot. Next up are the Legion Terminators with that five inch movement, a save of four plus, close assault factor of plus four, making them very formidable. They have a morale of three plus. Again, they can be taken as a separate support unit or a tactical upgrade, and they benefit from several traits and Legion special rules. They're a mid-priced close combat unit that has a few uses. Thunderhawks are a large assault transport, meaning that despite being bulky, eight Terminators can charge into combat on turn one. Also, the upcoming Spartan tank is an assault transport with five, meaning you can change or charge a unit of six tacticals and two Terminators out of two Spartans, utilizing all ten of those transport slots since the Terminators are going to be considered bulky and take up two slots each. This has the added benefit of giving the entire detachment of tacticals the implacable trait and a better save temporarily if you are taking wounds you can allocate maybe that first hit to some of the terminators until the first stand of terminators dies. 
or you could give them no transport at all, instead relying on their deep strike ability. The downside of this is they can't charge and will likely be vulnerable for a first turn. But they do have a pretty good uh, uh, attack when you give them an advance order. Leviathan Dreadnoughts are going to be the last thing I highlight here as an Astartes unit. They have a movement of 5 inch, save of 4, close assault factor of plus 5, morale 3. The, they can be taken as a contemptor upgrade or as a separate support unit. They are a walker, however, and they do benefit from several traits. While expensive, I like to call Dreadnoughts the Astartes Swiss Army Knife. Their plus 5 close assault factor is further amplified by the fact that they have rend. So no one is likely going to charge you because you are the strongest unit in the game at close combat. If you need to collapse a building, they've got a trait for that too, Wrecker, which means that they can base a building even without needing to charge. They're incredibly durable with a base save of 4+. plus. Because of their armored capability, they get to reroll saves against light weapons and have invul saves to protect against guns with more than minus 1 AP. They're especially scary when fully painted as green because they will not likely fail their morale checks and have implacable from the Salamander special rule. The next two units are for Solar Auxilia, starting off with the Sharonite Ogrens, movement of 5 inch, 6 plus save, close assault factor 3, morale 4, and these can be taken as a tertio upgrade or a separate support detachment, and they have Furious Charge, Rend, and they can be taken notably in the Pioneer Formation. Notably, the lower save of 6 plus means they are very much more susceptible to Overwatch fire than the Astartes units. As such, I feel that these are the and the upcoming Velatarian on the next slide are better off when used embedded into last but rifle tertios. Each model of the Ogren is extremely powerful already in combat, so you can simply use the cheaper tertio models as a blade of wounds. Legion's Imperialis doesn't often have much of a drawback for being aggressive with your units, as such, Ogren tend to want to close very quickly. Your opponent will likely paint a target on your Ogren and open fire like Kylo Ren shooting at Luke Skywalker. Let them do it. They're going to be wasting their points, and hopefully you're getting a trade up, and your more important units can perform quite well against them. Velatari have a 5-inch movement, 6 plus save, close assault factor 1, morale 4, same capability of being in a last rifle tertio upgrade or support unit, Ren, Steadfast, and can also be taken in the Pioneer Formation. Velatari are essentially the defensive version of Ogren. For a small points reduction, they trade two close assault factor and furious charge for having a Steadfast instead. My personal preference is to keep them kind of in a linebacker position with a charge order and wait patiently while holding an objective. Each detachment has a scale which determines how it interacts with other units. Detachments engaged with an enemy detachment that is equal to or larger in scale are not only engaged, but also pinned. Notably, when charging, at least one model must end in base-to-base -base contact with an enemy model. And consequently, after unit stats, because of the pinning mechanic, timing of the actual engagement can be the most important factor. The phases of the turn are very important to the timing effect. In the initiative phase, it doesn't come up very often, but a detachment that is already engaged or engaged in pin at the start of the orders phase cannot be issued with a charge order. Models in an engaged in pin detachment cannot voluntarily move during the movement phase unless otherwise instructed, nor can an engaged in pin detachment fire during the combat phase. A detachment that is engaged but not pinned can move and fire as normal. Remember, this occurs when one detachment has a larger scale. An engaged and pinned detachment that is activated in the movement phase, while issued with a charge, march, or advance order, may make a pile-in move, which is often overlooked in the rulebook. Only models that are not in base-to-base -base contact with an enemy model can make the pile-in movement. This often is a choice over using Overwatch for a unit, which I'll discuss later. Detachments that are engaged and pinned at the start of the first fire stage cannot be activated and simply discard their first fire order at the end of the stage. One popular tactic is trying to pin units to prevent them from using first fire. A model cannot target an enemy detachment that is engaged and pinned, but can target an enemy detachment that is engaged but not pinned. 
A model targeting a detachment that is engaged but not pinned suffers a minus one modifier to all hit rolls made against the detachment unless the detachments unless the target detachment scale is two or more higher than every detachment it is engaged with. When charging a detachment, there are few typical or even optimal reactions. If the target is larger in scale and has the capability to move with their order, they can simply move away. So engaging too quickly is a bad idea. If the target has a first fire order and will not be pinned, they will usually not fire overwatch, choosing to stand their ground and fire at another target before the engagement. Most of the time, a good opponent will likely have covering overwatch fire from one of their friendly units in this case. If the target has a first fire order and will be pinned, they will want to fire overwatch, as the first fire order will be discarded before they get to fire. If the target has already moved as part of their advance order, they have a decision to make. Because their shooting occurs after the engagement, they need to anticipate the engagement outcome and whether they'll still get to fire later. However, they'll typically overwatch before the risk of losing some models. Occasionally, you might charge a smaller detachment, meaning that while the target is pinned while well, you are not, keep in mind that enemy units can still fire at your models, so rather than using overwatch, they might shoot with other detachments in the hopes of unpinning theirs. Terrain is a pretty straightforward when it comes down to engagements. It often provides a, a penalty to hit. There's a difficult distance, so whenever you're moving through difficult terrain, it increases the amount of movement that you have to spend. They have a cover save. Garrison provides both of those, harder to hit and a cover save, but keep in mind that structures are sometimes a death trap. At the very beginning of the game, you'll want to evaluate whether or not your opponent has an effective way to deal with structures. If they do, if they have lots of wrecker, or if they have long-range structure killing capability, those things are going to be a death trap, and you'll want to avoid them. One of the more controversial tactics that I've seen is the silhouette camo. I've submitted this question to GW for a ruling, but there is currently a silly rules as written interaction with titans and structures. Since a titan in base contact with a structure counts as engaged, with zero regard to whether it is garrisoned, if a, if a titan stands next to a building, a model targeting a detachment that is engaged but not pinned suffers a minus one modifier to hit rolls. This is because structures do not have a scale, so the exception written in the rulebook of scale difference can never be met, even if the Titan is not obscured. So for example, this uh, Titan you see on the screen is, has a, is harder to hit because its base is touching that building, and so its silhouette is being obscured by it. The Distraction Carnifex is a tale as old as time. One of the things you'll want to consider when you are thinking about a sacrificial screen are using expendable units. Those are going to be cheap core infantry, single rhinos, maybe the Arvis after it has dropped off. These models, their main purpose now becomes disruption. You want to prevent engagements, lock things up, pin other units, block narrow sections, and things like that. In fact, this image does a good job to point out that infantry should be in front of all of your important vehicles. Those vehicles are screened from being charged by any of the opponent's Ogryn or anything else. There are often times when you want to manipulate engagements. Consider a situation where you have infantry models charging vehicles. Let's say four infantry survive overwatch and successfully charge three rhinos. I'm not going to demonstrate the exact math, but you actually have better odds of killing two tanks and making the detachment flee if you pair up two infantry versus one tank and do that twice and leave the third tank out of the engagement. This situation compounds when you have two rivo rhinos or Arvis lighters or any of the units in the Great Slaughter book that are coming up with a 20 inch charge range. I call this the rhino entanglement maneuver. And if you charge a detachment, but both of your models base only a single model of theirs, the rest of their models can't shoot or participate in the engagement. That's a really nice five model squad of Lehman Russ vanquishers you have there. It'd be a shame if my 20 points of rhinos held it and prevented it from shooting at anything useful for an entire turn. That's a sacrifice I'm willing to make. 
In fact, if you charge even a single rhino into an entire detachment of infantry, maybe they had a charge order and waiting to react. They are pinned, and while your rhinos can still fire their point defense weapons at another detachment after they've moved, because they are not pinned. In my opinion, this fact single-handedly increases the value of point defense weapons that are not light. Notable examples of this are the autocannon sponsons on the blade and blade, the Havoc missile launcher on Rhinos, as well as a few examples on Auxilia air support and Titans. The opposite situation is where you choose to engage another detachment with the minimum possible by doing only one infantry or one Rhino to engage another detachment. You preserve your unit's survivability, even if it loses every single combat role. The Dire Wolf Scout and Titan has a unique role of all the other Titans in the fact that it is only 385 points, but has Infiltrate. It earns its special place as an honorable mention for its engagement capabilities. It comes standard with the Infiltrate trait, which means that it can deploy after your opponent's army anywhere outside of 4 inches. It has a 7 inch movement. It has Agile, which gives it an additional turn, Point Defects, Ardex, Mega Bolters. Simply deploy as close as possible to your opponent's Titan and give it a charge order. And if you get initiative or happen to be Emperor's Children Formation, you are guaranteed to lock down an opponent's Titan. If you fail to get the initiative, your opponent may try to get away from your charge. But with only a 5 or 6 inch advance, well short of your 14 inch with Agile movement, more so prior to your movement, you can fire your 9 dice point defense attack from your Ardex Mega Bolter. Because of their cost, very few large titans are running melee weapons, so neither titan will likely fall during the few several turns of the engagement where these two are locked in heated battle, dealing only one damage to each other all game. Effectively, you will have only spent 385 points to neutralize a 6 or 700 point threat. This is especially true if large titans become meta or popular. One notable counter to the strategy is actually the Warlord Battle Titan. It is the only Titan that has both a melee and ranged weapon, the Ariok Power Claw. Because of that, I think that's the uh, best Titan in the game. The only Titan which functions effectively both as ranged without using one of its weapon slots as a dedicated melee weapon. And of course, Titans are cool. Why wouldn't you want to use them? And that is all I have for today. I hope you enjoyed this video. Adieu.